Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Since we're on the uh, Latin American Symposium, it's appropriate to say buenos dias a todos. So good morning. Good morning to everybody joining us remotely. Uh, my name is Mariana Chavez McGregor, and I'm the Executive Officer for International Affairs. It is my privilege and pleasure to welcome you all this morning in person to, to talk about what we're doing in, in this group, um, talk about potential collaborations, um, some housekeeping items before. Uh, when we have our, we're gonna circulate some agendas that, that we have printed out. Um, we have made some times for questions and a round table at the end. We will ask you all to speak from the microphone so our colleagues that are joining us virtually can, can listen to us. Uh, everybody on the Zoom, please uh, remain mute. We will be monitoring the chat. Um, so, so we will you know, start in a, in a few minutes. I, I just want to start, of course, by by thanking a lot of people that have made you know this happen. Of course, a lot of what we do here we couldn't do without the support of the Hope Foundation. So thank you so much for for all of that, uh, John. It's always our you know guide and direction, and and we couldn't do what we do with without him. The team at uh, Swag Operations has been just absolutely phenomenal trying to help us troubleshoot and find better ways for all of us to really work together. So not to you know be too extensive, but Dana, Courtney, um, Connie, and then of course, Kat, the people at IROC. I mean, there's a number of people that make this happen. Of course, all of you at your different national sites and the teams that are behind. And last but not least, um, Dacia, who you all know that that keeps things moving. Um, we have some really exciting uh, projects for the Latin America Initiative. We want this to be much more bi-directional. We continue to encourage our investigators to, to be part of committee members. And something that we're going to kick off with this meeting is we're planning a newsletter. Every six months after group meeting, we're going to have a newsletter where we're going to just distribute um, the content to you know, hopefully all the SWOG investigators to get to know about what we're doing and all the opportunities. So the content of the first one will be a brief of a summary of what we're going to be discussing here. We're going to try to highlight one institution at a time because we want to become very relevant for SWOG investigators. We want to be attractive and we want to give all of you um, the recognition that you deserve. So without um, more um, welcomes, we're going to start with our first presentation uh, by Dr. Joe Unger. Uh, many of you know him. He's an associate professor at the Fred Hodge, so he didn't get to travel far to come and join us. Um, he is a very experienced uh, health services researcher. He's a, a biostatistician, and he works at the SWOG Statistics and uh, Data Management Center. Um, he is the vice chair of the SWOG NCORP. Uh, he's a PI of the SDMC Cancer Care Delivery Program. He has more JAM Oncology papers than anybody I know, I think. And he has done extensive work trying to understand the impact of SWOG's work, uh, and also as it relates to um, racial and ethnic minorities. So thank you so much, um, Joe. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's uh, great to be back in the a live audience in person. Um, I think it's the other arrow. It's down. Right about there. No? It's not working. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, Sorry, just one second. Well, I can give my wind up. Uh, the last, the last talk I gave was my promotion seminar. The last in-person talk, Marion remembers. It was just before COVID, it was as COVID was descending. And there was, um, people had their, you know, I, I like to think it was COVID. They had one foot out the door. Um, maybe it was the material, but um, at least this guy stayed in the room. Okay, now granted he fell asleep, but be that as it may. Oh, thanks. And then I have a captive audience. So here's my kids. <laughs> Um, 
So anyway, I want to talk. Uh, I have a lot of slides, too many for the 15 minutes, but um, about how to ensure uh, diverse enrollment in clinical trials. So just taking the 30,000 foot perspective, um, the goal of clinical research is to accelerate the discovery and adoption of new treatments for patients with cancer so that they um, become disseminated into clinical practice. So between the cancer population uh, uh, and the impact of, and diffusion of new treatments is this discovery pathway, which is <clears throat> initiated by the discovery of new treatments and then their advancement to comparative testing in a randomized trial where the representativeness is one of the key elements of uh, understanding and interpreting the data which helps guide treatment decision making on the part of patients physicians and, and payers which ultimately influences the impact and diffusion of new treatments this um, so this discovery pathway is really a um, it's a mediating it's a research process it's a mediator and this idea of clinical trials in the endeavor as being a research process was uh, mentioned uh, in the 2010 IOM report which um, said great things about the network groups uh, as well as by the cancer moonshot. Um, Unfortunately, not a lot of patients, as we know, participate in clinical trials. Historically, the estimate's been two to 3%. I think it's actually twice that, probably around 6%. Uh, those studies are old, um, but they're, but you know, a lot of patients nonetheless say they would be much more, uh, they would be more than willing to participate. So there's this large gap between willingness and actual participation. And it reflects the many barriers that patients face. Um, so understanding the magnitude uh, and the types of barriers is really critical to helping to um, alleviate this gap. So my colleagues and I devised this framework for, to help understand the process of treatment decision making. And you can see it starts at uh, initially at a clinic visit where there's a, this, now this is granted somewhat oversimplified, but nonetheless, it helps uh, to guide the research and is important for understanding what we're talking about here. So initially there'll be a clinic visit. There'll be a determination about whether a trial is available or not. Uh, there'll be, if the trial is available, there'll be a determination about whether or not the patients are eligible. And if the patient is eligible, then only then does it enter into that interaction between the physician and the patient. And ultimately if a trial is offered, then a patient uh, agrees or disagrees to participate. Um, and so patient agency in this process, as you can see, comes at the end of a very long pathway. Nonetheless, the onus of barriers to trial participation, in my view, have historically somewhat misguidedly been put on the patient. That has been the emphasis. But it really is these structural and clinical barriers that are getting in the way. Structural barriers can you know, largely be about the fact that um, it's just hard to enact and implement and keep going uh, a clinical trial program, especially mostly where most patients get uh, treatment in their community. <clears throat> it's expensive, it takes a lot of time and effort, it's probably not fully compensated. Uh, even if a trial is available, uh, patients are not gonna be uh, eligible much of the time. Um, this is borrowed from a wonderful book by Green et al, including Crowley, this very succinct sort of characterization of the balance that trials are trying to strike in terms of eligibility. They wanna be sufficiently narrow so that a treatment effect can be considered approximately constant across the different groups of patients, but also sufficiently broad so the trial results apply to a meaningful population of patients. In the event, um, trials are generally considered to be having eligibility criteria that are too narrow, which uh, sacrificing uh, generalizability and also reducing access. The dominant reasons we've found and most many have found for ineligibility exclusions is simply the presence of comorbid conditions. Uh, about 60% of the major eligibility criteria really do relate to comorbidities. Um, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, Friends of Cancer Research, and the FDA, as you know, are trying to alleviate this issue by revisiting many of the 
uh, eligibility criteria that have grown up in trials over the decades and modernized them. And they've made a lot of recommendations already, which I think are starting to help. Physicians, of course, in their guiding role, um, uh, may have their own concerns. They may prefer a specific treatment. They may worry that the uh, participation in trial can interfere with their relationship with a patient in some fashion. And of course, very practical considerations about uh, reimbursement and time and effort. And then ultimately the decision rests with patients. Um, one motivation for patients is altruism. They wanna to contribute to the future generations if they can. They also want to um, get the best treatment for their cancer. Um, and, and, but a lot of them express a lot of misgivings about whether or not to participate around, largely around the idea of wanting to control their treatment choice and being somewhat hesitant about participating in a trial, which is an experiment, uh, in part because of past abuses that many of us, we all recognize. The, um, so this pathway, of course, is, so, so, um, disparities and in barriers, to, not just barriers, but disparities in access to trials are, can build up all, all along this pathway. Disparity is related to demographic variables, geographic variables, socioeconomic variables. As it turns out, looking through uh, doing in a systematic review and meta-analysis of trials that met the sort of described treatment decision-making in this, roughly in this framework, for more than half of patients, there is no trial available, 56%. For another 22%, if there is a trial available, they're not eligible. So for three, more than three out of four patients, they don't even get the chance to have an interaction with their physician about whether or not participate in a trial. Uh, in my view, that really does take the onus off the patient. It's about the system and the, and the way the trials are conducted and how they're available to patients. A key question then, given that, is if you can, if you just examine patients who are offered a trial, how likely are they to participate? So we followed up that systematic review and just conditioned or just selected studies that actually uh, uh, characterize the extent to which uh, patients were offered a trial and then how, much, how often they agreed to participate. And it turns out that more than half of patients agree to participate if a trial is offered to them. So there's a trial available, they meet the eligibility criteria, they more likely than not will agree to participate. This differs somewhat by community versus academic sites, but not terribly. And even more critically, perhaps, there was no difference by race and ethnicity. In fact, black, white, and Asian patients agreed to participate more than white patients, um, at least in the observed rates. So this really does sort of put the lie to the idea, two, two ideas. First, it dramatically underscores the willingness of patients to participate in clinical research if they have an opportunity to do so and it's presented to them. Also, the findings stand in stark contrast, very stark contrast, to the commonly cited statistic that only 5% of patients participate in trials, which is an unfair statistic for patients because it does not characterize all of the things that get in the way of their participation. Moreover, Black, Asian, and Hispanic patients enrolled at rates that were at least as high as white patients. And it suggests that uh, observed disparities in access to trials actually occur higher up that pathway in the structural clinical domains, probably. The findings indicate and suggest that a good way to improve enrollment of minority patients is to simply ensure that they're asked. Don't presume that they're distrustful, you know, for instance. Maybe they are not. Um, <clears throat> you know, this really is key. A, a, a very, um, I would say, a seminal paper came out in 2019, JAMA Oncology, by Laurie and colleagues, which looked at the participation by demographic race, ethnicity in trials that led to FDA new drug approvals. Um, as you can see, Black participation was really, really disastrously low, only about 3% compared to about 14% of the population. Hispanic participation was also quite low. 
Um, I know that the FDA is working on this issue. Um, they conducted a working group uh, in combination with AACR to figure out how to improve enrollment of black patients to myeloma trials, which is a particular issue in myeloma. Um, their idea is that any model that they come up with maybe could be generalized to other cancers. <clears throat> I know from my own perspective, and I think we in SWOG know that those rates of black participation that doesn't mess with what we know. It's much better in SWOG. Now, why would that be? Um, <clears throat> I, I collaborated with those folks who put out that paper and did a sort of a matched analysis where we matched cancer types and year of enrollment to look at black participation or proportion of patients who are black in SWOG trials compared to the FDA registration pivotal trials, which are almost entirely conducted by pharma. And it turns out enrollment again in the FDA pivotal trials was 3%, uh, a comparable rate in SWOG trials was 9%, three times higher. Uh, the rate in the corresponding US cancer population was 12%. So why this vast difference? Well, as I mentioned, most of the trials that lead to FDA new drug approvals are conducted by pharma, whereas the NCI sponsored groups, they have a different motivation for their trials. And one of which is that there is a built-in mechanism to reach out to community minority and underserved sites through the, the NCI's Community Oncology Research Program. The idea of the Community Oncology Research Program is to bring trials to the community, to where patients are actually getting care. And I think that that, in my view, is really critical for understanding what pharma needs to do if they want to improve enrollment to trials. They need to bring trials to the community. They can't just be localized at the uh, large academic centers. They have to reach out better. Just as a, as a sense of the success of the NCOR, we looked at geographic distribution of SWOG enrollments over a long period of time and 44 trials of nearly 37,000 patients and we uh, in SWOG, 19% of our patients are from rural areas, which is bang on the same rate as a proportion of individuals in the US who are from rural areas. So again, more evidence about how successful the NCOR is in my view. Three minute warning, thank you. I think I, I just wanna to touch uh, as well on the idea of um, financial toxicity. This is a really important paper that came out, Vina Shankaran and working with SWOG, showing that even in a, in a um, group of patients who are almost entirely uh, <clears throat> uh, insured, nearly three quarters of these metastatic colorectal cancer patients experience major financial hardship within the first year after their treatment. Really dramatic result. As it pertains to participation in a clinical trial, Income disparities have not been very well studied, in part because we don't collect income on our trial patients. It's never been considered relevant, at least historically. I think it is much more so considered relevant nowadays. Um, I collaborated with Dr. Crowley and others to conduct a, um, a web-based survey of patients to actually get at patients and ask them about their income as they're alongside understanding their treatment decision-making process and we enrolled 5,500 patients to this survey. And what we found was that patient income was a uniform predictor across all kinds of different subgroups of patients in terms of predicting lower trial participation. We subsequently confirmed this in a separate independent study, same pattern. Moreover, the, more, the, the less income that individuals have, the more likely they are to be concerned about how to pay for a trial as indicated in this graph. Now, the RAND Corporation and others, it's been a while since good data has come out, but have indicated that um, trials are not disproportionately uh, uh, more expensive than non-trial care, um, but nonetheless, this disparity exists. And it suggests, in my view, that there's a sort of interaction in patients. They're not just worried about um, they're not just sensitive to the perhaps the minor, what some of us might consider minor costs, co-pays and co-insurance, but also the indirect costs of trial participation, having to take time off work, having to get childcare, 
uh, having to travel, uh, et cetera. And these things can be uh, differential, impact individuals differently by race, excuse me, by socioeconomic status and potentially by race. One minute, thank you. So why do we care about this? Well, participation in clinical trials, of course, often represents an opportunity to receive the newest treatments. Uh, for patients, such a system should be free, in my view, of the structural and patient barriers that have been routinely identified. And such a system would, would also build greater confidence in the generalizability of, of our trial results, as well as allow us to enroll to trials better. So just to get back to the original um, uh, title of the talk, which was actually assigned to me, I realized two days ago. So um, how do we ensure diverse, better diverse populations in clinical research. One, ensure that trials are accessible to patients where they receive their care. Two, offer them the opportunity to participate in a trial. Three, provide them the resources and the support to do so. Thank you. Thank you. We have like one minute for one quick question. If somebody has one, we're monitoring the chat. I know, Joe, that you have to run to the Cancer Care Delivery Committee, but thank you so much. Thank Clearly, you. as you can see, there's there's big commitment from SWOG to, to ensure that, that the impact of diversity, uh, it's known. And, and thank you, Joe, for leading some of those efforts. As, as you, you know, hear the talk, we really want to talk about diversity, inclusion, the value of uh, accruing uh, diverse populations to our clinical trials. And we could not do that without also having the voice of our advocates and our patients. It's really a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Barba Segarra Vasquez. Dr. Segarra is the Dean of the School of Health Professions in Puerto Rico. She's the principal investigator of a large R25 training program for young investigators because she's committed to make sure that that we all uh, know about since very early in our training about diversity and inclusion. She is um, openly, and I'm not disclosing anything that she's not very proud of, but she's a, a, a two times breast cancer survivor. She served as um, advocate for SWOG and for many other very important organizations. So Barbara, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, and I'm going to start because I'm more scared of Dacia that she's going to have the ring thing than my presentation. So, and I, I tried this when I presented from Mexico. Um, so uh, a lot of the things that I was going to cover were mentioned by uh, Dr. Unger. So it's easier than to concentrate in other areas. But in terms of um, looking back at what the United States has done to increase diversity and inclusion um, it, with government initiatives, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, research and advocates working together. So the government in the United States um, thought they discovered America in 1993 and decided that they needed more women and minorities in research. And since then, they done different initiative that we'll see that the impact has not been uh, that large. And actually um, they even have a National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities. However, more than 20 years um, have passed and now we see that racial and ethnic minorities represent 40% of the US population. And in many states, we are the majority. Our research participation does not reflect the, the country countries changing population when we saw it with Dr. Unger. And NCI trials in which the primary focus was racial or minority population was less than 2%. There was a study done that uh, if we uh, diminish the health disparity, the uh, United States will save more than $2 trillion. Uh, but some people argue that having minorities in research is has a higher cost, cost but they it outweighs um, the long-term benefits. Um, this was the paper that Dr. Unger mentioned where Black and Hispanic in particular were underrepresented in trials that led to drug approvals. There were far fewer Black and Hispanic patients in cancer clinical trials 
that would be expected. And as Dr. Unger mentioned, the challenges that minorities have are usually um, uh, transportation, childcare, Many minorities have two or three jobs. So in order to participate in a trial, they will have to take time off work. So that all um, uh, is a barrier for minorities to participate. So there are things that when the trial is designed that could compensate for that, giving them uh, childcare, money, having the, the, um, the participation flexible in terms of time and when people can attend. This other in terms of uh, one of the things that we're moving or in uh, for many years now is um, precision medicine, and that is going to represent even a higher disparity when you look at the Latino and minorities participation in genetic testing. Uh, so that instead of helping uh, minority is going to even um, have a bigger gap then and most of the thing has been the lack of access when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in Puerto Rico in 2003 no insurance covered the BRCA uh, testing that now is more complicated right has more genes but at that time it will cost six uh, five or six thousand dollars that patients usually don't have um, this is uh, some of the things that Dr. Unger mentioned as well, and the FDA is trying to uh, develop a new guidelines in terms of trying to um, recommend being more flexible or broaden eligibility criteria because especially minorities has a lot of comorbidities and um, they will be uh, excluded from trials. When we talk about uh, diversity in uh, clinical trial, it goes beyond uh, enrollment. It goes into researchers. We need a diverse group of researchers uh, from diverse backgrounds. We need diverse team, people who look at like the community. Um, study sections, these grants that are submitted to NIH and others have study sections and usually the people who are invited to um, evaluate those proposals are people who get grants and then our minorities are not getting grants so they don't sit at the table. So we have a discrimination in their area. Um, recruiting physicians, if there's gonna be a study with multi-site and try to be sure to include those sites that serve minorities. And patient advocates, there is even in, in advocacy, there is a lack of diversity. Um, I, in the breast cancer field, I've been a patient advocate for more than 10 years, and I can tell you in a handful, the number of Latinas advocates that they are available. And when we talk about patient advocates, we're talking about an individual or an organization uh, a patient or a family member that represent that voice of the patient or the, of a disease. And when we talk about mostly research advocates is uh, uh, th that person that brings a non-scientific viewpoints to the research process and communicates collective patient perspective. This concept of, pa of patient advocates is not developed in many of the Latin American countries and not even in Puerto Rico that we have been part of the United States forever. Um, so if I do this for the Latinas here. And when I talk to my colleagues in Puerto Rico, they don't get the importance of including uh, advocates in what they do. SWOG has been um, very uh, proactive in including uh, advocates from in their page. You can find that in 1993, they invited the first group of patients. And in 97, they uh, had a pilot that was endorsed by NCI. And now um, advocates are now permanent partners of SWOG. And I'm happy to have like seven uh, colleagues of uh, patient advocates here. So thank you for being here. These are very passionate people and you'll see what we all do. And in 2019, and the patient advocate included um, community advocates because uh, we needed people who represented Latinos, LGBTQ crew, um, and all these other communities to bring the community perspective of what we do. In SWAG, we also have like a framework of how we could get patient and advocates working together. And it goes uh, from the whole cycle, from the defining to the dissemination. And when, when an idea is being in, in conceptualized, uh, patients can get fat feedback, can ask questions. Um, when you are in the review process, they can uh, ask, tell you about feasibility. I remember I had a colleague who was gonna develop um, uh, 
uh, exercise intervention for breast cancer patients six months out of, out of their treatment. And I told, I don't think that's practical. They had to come during the day to do the, um, the evaluation and exercise treatment. I said, after you're a year on treatment and you're going back to work, you're not gonna take time off to go to an exercise if you don't accommodate that in flexible hours, right? Um, patient advocates help was informed consent. You know, is it understandable? Will a patient understand what is it that you want to say? Um, and implementation, when there's um, barriers uh, to uh, recruitment and things, patient, uh, patient advocates can help. Today, we have a panel for one of the, actually the credit um, financial toxicity that we're going to talk about strategies from the patient's perspective of how, when to talk to a patient and how to talk to them. And you'll see that patient engagement contributes to research questions and outcomes that are important to patients. We're going to say uh, improve clinical trials feasibility. Uh, we can improve accrual and retention. It helps other advocates understand and effectively communicate about science, right? It, it, we can be that liaison between the community. Uh, there was a study here and, and our leader, Rick Banks, uh, was a patient advocate for the, is for the bladder um, uh, disease committee. And they had a trial that was about to close because they weren't able to recruit um, patients to this trial. So the advocates got together and developed different strategies of um, the communication that we're getting to the patients, how to communicate, et cetera. And they were able uh, in a short amount of time to exponentially improve the accrual and meet the goal. There was a paper I reviewed for this presentation from PCORI, Patient Oriented uh, Research Outcome, uh, that uh, they review all the uh, papers published that uh, mentioned patient engagement, and they had different ideas um, uh, or presented um, how patients help, um, for example, in tailoring interventions like the format or how many times a patient should come or not to an intervention in recruitment and retention. And I gave you an example of what we do at SWOG. Um, and in dissemination, once the uh, trial complete, how we get back the results to those patients that participate and the general public as well. And um, here at SWOG, uh, when a concept is presented, uh, our patient advocates, as I mentioned, we have 30 patient advocates, 20 of us sit in different um, committees. I sit in the Cancer Care Delivery Committee. So when a concept is developed as patient advocates, we participate as well and tell, give our ideas if it's um, feasible, if it's important for patients. And then from there on, we participate in the whole process, uh, uh, informed consent, uh, helping recruit, et cetera. So what can we do? We can um, have a diverse research team, find community-based organization. If, if in your area, you don't have organizations like we have here, different big organizations that have advocates available, you can start talking to patients in your area and have informal um, discussions or have focus group for, to understand what is important to them and how will be um, feasible to recruit them. And um, important, the last part is um, advocates and researchers is a two-way uh, learning process. We learn about the research and how it's done, but you learn from the patients how it could be done and how it be, um, will really benefit the patients. Uh, you all receive in your packet, uh, talk, going back again to diversity, um, uh, a methodology of how we can make sure uh, we keep doing things to improve diversity. I remember I was recruited as a patient advocate for SWOG in 2017. And my first question was, how many Latinos have participated in these research? Because sitting at the table makes, um, you have to have someone who brings up and it's not that people don't want, it's, it, they don't have it in the front of their mind like we all do because we work with our communities. Um, and for example, and when what uh, uh, Dr. Unger mentioned that uh, uh, people want to participate, I, I was a patient advocate for one of the SWOG uh, um, study called Tracer, and they were recruiting in Puerto Rico. And it was after Hurricane Maria, where, where the whole island was without electricity for more than uh, six months. Um, we started to, I live in the uh, metropolitan area, I was without electricity two and a half months. But anyways, when we, they were reviewing uh, the accrual process, 
Um, there were uh, sites here in the state that had not recruited anyone. And in Puerto Rico, they recruited the first patient for this trial, even after Hurricane Maria. So that accounts to what um, uh, the willingness of Latinos. And what you hear when you look at the literature, they keep saying that uh, Latinos have mistrust or Latinos uh, don't want to participate. And that is not true. So uh, in conclusion, we know that after 20 years, we have still a lot to do to increase minorities in, in research. SWOG has included advocates since the 90s. Really listen to advocates and members of your community of how you can do better or make a research better because at the end, that's all what we want. We want patients to uh, live more, right? Patients are expert in their disease and are willing to share their experience. And inclusion of diverse population and research guarantees justice and systematic. Yesterday, they were uh, one of the presenters said uh, clinical trials offer treatments, uh, tomorrow's treatments to today patients, and we some patients cannot wait. And I always like to reflect, I was diagnosed twice with breast cancer. The first time in the left was uh, immediately after I had my uh, lumpectomy and my sons were um, 10 or 14 at the time. I lost all my hair since my skin or radiation therapy, et cetera, et cetera. And the picture on the right was uh, last September that I was blessed enough to celebrate my 60th birthday. Yeah, I know I don't look 60, but... Um, my boys are now uh, 28 and 32. Um, so I live through that because of science. So please do it. Um, they are not married. I want to be a grandma. So I need more science just in case. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Segarra. Wonderful presentation, really highlighting the, the importance of involving advocates. Is somebody in, in the mic? Um, my name is Irene Tami. I'm from the University of Texas. What, uh, what has been done in the U.S. to recruit in clinical trial Latinos who are not documented? Because who, that who, who are not who are illegal in the U.S. yet uh, getting cancer as any other human being. So um, from my experience, that has been always a challenge because how you can compensate them, how can you even uh, get them into care when they don't have social security number and all these, uh, these requirements. Yeah, and some because of the studies don't discriminate, but that's the thing of having champions in the community, people who can talk to them and say that they trust and say, come, you're gonna be safe. This is a safe place, you're gonna be able but yeah, but beyond yes. uh, the access is what I'm talking about is how can get them into these clinical settings if they don't have a social security number is where I see the barrier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the huge barrier. But and thank I think you so much. And I think we have to do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. We might have time for one additional question or comment. If there's none, maybe I'll ask one, but I, I was really... Um, I don't know if you can elaborate more and emphasize how Latinx communities are really open to clinical trials. I think there's a lot of um, cultural misinterpretation and biases thinking that maybe we won't even um, consider. You know, consider maybe language can be a barrier, right? We busy clinicians might prefer not to involve an interpreter, but I think it's important to emphasize the message that these communities are open. And, and, and so I don't know if you can elaborate a little bit more. And it is. And in Puerto Rico, for example, we have a lot of clinical trials um, going on and the recruitment and most of us, most of all, the retention of that, of this community is huge. We are altruistic. We really want to uh, help each other. So once they commit to that, they really stay in the study. So I think it's First, trying to um, tell, convince the researchers that we are there and, and, and they kind of lump us. Um, Latinos are very, Latinx is very complicated. Our Spanish in Puerto Rico is different from the Spanish in Cuba. So translating the documents is a little more difficult as well. And I think the other thing is we need more patient advocates. I think we have to um, have a, a training program or something to train more Latinas. To represent because once you sit at a table, people really listen and, and consider, and you can bring this information up forward. Yes. I just have a comment. I think that uh, SWAG needs to consider stipending patients. URCC 
stipends the majority of their clinical trial patients in their in core trials. It's not a lot of money, but it shows a little respect for the additional time that a lot of the questionnaires and surveys take. And it, I see a huge impact in presenting a trial with a small amount of stipend. And I just think it's respectful. So I continue to advocate for other research bases to consider that, whether it helps with gas money or having lunch because you spent an extra two hours at the cancer center with the research staff. Just my comment. Thank you very much. Yeah, and and having, having materials in, in Spanish, you know, sometimes when I started also, I review a concept and I asked why it wasn't in Spanish. And the answer was that it was too expensive. Yeah, it could be too expensive, but we have to invest in that. So thank you, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And we, we are going to have to to move on just to stay in track with the agenda, but clearly very important topics from the, from, from the relevance of including and thinking ahead of time on how to you know, um, make these patients feel included. Now to have the other perspective of things, we, we wanted to show how SWOG from our leadership team can have a lot of opportunities for Latin American sites. And it's a pleasure that Dr. An Chiang agreed to join us today. She's a medical oncologist specializing in thoracic oncology. She's an associate professor and the chief integration officer and deputy chief medical officer at uh, Willow Cancer Network that belongs to the Yale Cancer Center. And she's the executive officer for the breast and the thoracic committees here at SWAG. So two very large committees, diseases that are highly prevalent all over the world, but of course, also in our Latin American sites. So thank you, Dr. Xiang, uh, for joining us and telling us about, you know, how we could um, be relevant in your committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is such an honor to participate here and this is my first meeting back in person. Um, one of the first things I wanted to tell you is that when Mariana asked me to do this, I, I spoke to both of our committees um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. Um, not only is there enthusiasm for uh, engagement at all levels, uh, but, but just also a focus um, on uh, diversity overall in the institution for SWOG from the executive level and within the communities. We each now have a, a diversity representative. So folks are really excited. Um, the leadership and the committees felt that there was a real role for lots of engagement at all levels. Um, so there was a welcome invitation to come and participate in the group meetings, uh, to engage in discussion around new and developing studies, um, to talk about feasibility. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of getting trials open uh, in Latin America. Uh, for accrual and and um, really to serve as investigators or champions, I and mean, we felt that that was one of the 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 strong one of the most engaged ways or one of the best ways to get involvement. Um, and then there's lots of opportunities in translational medicine as well. Uh, and I'll just use an example: the Alchemist Working Group. Uh, there was a meeting that in, in invited every anyone who was interested, and there's opportunities there not only for input but also facilitating some of the leadership of of these subcommittees. So um, lots of opportunities there. Um, the other topic that came up was really that there's a gap in education and around what uh, what are the what is the process and what uh, are feasibility feasibility issues around participation in trials in Latin America. And I think that uh, there were a lot of questions around drug access and availability, uh, specimen processing time, shipment frequency, country specific uh, issues, and, and several people who said, gee, can we just have a list that would help us in terms of thinking about um, what is involved in the process, who, which approvals have to happen, and um, how, can we, how can we make uh, this a more seamless process? And, and how can we involve, um, think of these issues earlier in the activation development of studies? So I think that the most important part of that is that this is an active conversation back and forth. Um, and, and as such, I told them that I was gonna be speaking here and bringing what your input um, back to the, the committees and, and uh, talking more about feasibility. So one of the things I would like to do uh, before I go further is take a picture of you so that I can show that when I go back there. So I'm gonna do a panoramic 
and um, and it also because it's an in-person meeting, so I'm so excited about this. And so if you guys would all, you know, um, wait, raise your hands, maybe remove your masks and raise your hands. I'm going to start over here. And I think that this is just such an exciting time. Absolutely great. I love it. I love it. And I'll send this back to you as well. Thank you very much for <laughs> indulging me. Um, okay. So next, I want to just spend some time both on the breast and the lung committees and just sort of give you a download of what is happening now and what are some of the studies that we're thinking about um, that would be feasible. And we'd love to have your participation. Um, so these are the chairs, Dr. Lash Pushtai on the left and Priyanka, Dr. Priyanka Sharma uh, on the right. Um, Again, here's our DEI represented, Gayafi Nagaraj uh, and our super staff, um, TM Alistair Thompson. Again, if you're interested in breast and how many of you, again, raise your hands, how many have or treat patients with breast cancer? Okay. Fantastic, so a lot. Uh, so reach out and um, always looking for engagement. Um, I'm just gonna go through, so exciting time this last year, publications that have come out. Uh, here's the S1007 study that Kevin Kalinske presented at San Antonio and was published in December in the New England Journal. Um, really excited about that result. And these are the studies that are currently closed and awaiting results. So we're excited that the S1418 just um, uh, closed and uh, finished accrual with 1,100 or 1,200 patients. This is a randomized phase three trial looking at PEMBRO as adjuvant therapy for triple negative breast cancer with residual disease or positive lymph nodes after new adjuvant therapy. Uh, we're getting the first results from the um, S1007 trial um, in May. Uh, endocrine um, plus or minus chemo, uh, our expander. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, this one, the S1207. So this is uh, the use of adjuvant endocrine therapy plus or minus one year of everolimus, uh, as well as the S1416 in BRCA or triple negative patients, a randomized phase two cisplatin alone or with um, uh, the PARP inhibitor of the So these two studies are currently open and accruing. And I think we're looking at um, feasibility here for this trial, the S1706. This is a really important proof of um, concept trial, really looking at the synergism between uh, PARP inhibitor with or without PARP inhibitor with uh, radiation or radiation alone in this very rare but very high risk uh, uh, breast cancer, um, inflammatory breast cancer population. And then this is the 200, 2007 sasituzumab go can for HER2 negative brain cancer and brain nuts. This is activated in June uh, and the accrual is actually pretty low right now, but it's a, it's a smaller population. Um, studies in development right now. So the S2202 phase two residual disease, um, <coughs> triple negative with trope two antibody drug conjugate, sansituzumab gobatecan. Uh, and I think this trial is something that we'd love to explore with, with you as well. So it's a randomized trial for neoadjuvant DERVA plus chemo versus chemo alone for mammoprint high, um, mammoprint two high hormone receptor positive HER2 negative uh, breast uh, cancer. And this is, you know, we did discuss this in, in the committee and the questions again, as I talked about before were, you know, what's the feasibility of this? We'd love to have your participation. How easy is it to get mammoprint in Latin America and, and what about drug distribution availability and access? Um, I'm gonna switch over to the lung committee and just, this is real important. Uh, uh, Janelle Gray just steps in this meeting as our new lung chair, really super excited about that. Dr. Roy Herbst, our vice chair. Um, you know, again, uh, this is our team, our Lucy Ganzauer is our DEI representative. Uh, our patient advocate, Judy Johnson, was here, had to leave, um, and, and other folks, TM Core, Philip Mack. Again, if you're interested in, in participating and get, giving your input into our lung committee, you're very, very welcome. Um, those of you that treat lung cancer, raise your hands. 
Fantastic. So expect to see you in the lunch committees and uh, and expect to hear you in the lunch committees as well. Um, and have heard you. So um, these are our publications last year. This is Fred Hirsch's uh, led this analysis of the S0819, um, uh, our uh, trial with, uh, with or without Cetuximab um, and looking at EGFR high copy number with high EGFR uh, protein expression and uh, uh, Dr. Phil Mack, uh, this S1403 circulating um, tumor DNA kinetics for predicting progression for <coughs> overall survival uh, in TKI treated patients. Um, these studies are closed awaiting results. Uh, I won't spend on time on those, but I will talk about some of these studies currently open and accruing. And, and I think you guys are exploring feasibility in these two trials here, the S1827 phase three study of surveillance MR with or without prophylactic cranial irradiation in small cell, which would be really, really terrific, I think. Uh, and then the S1914 uh, randomized phase three trial of SBRT with or without atezolizumab in medically inoperable stage one non-small cell lung cancer. And I would say this is uh, my trial uh, that I co-chair with Haas Borgai from ECOG the Insigna trial, and actually, I think I have a picture of it. I'd love to explore um, uh, participation in this trial as well. This is for a PDL1 positive um, uh, non squamous lung cancer. And then the patients are either uh, randomized to Pembro alone, and then if they progress, they get chemo, Pembro alone, and then they add, and then we add chemo to the Pembro post progression. That's an important question that really hasn't been answered yet or this is our, our chemo um, plus uh, immunotherapy control. And I think this is really important to understand what the sequencing of, of drugs uh, is here, whether or not you need to use your first, your, all of your guns first, or if, it, if there's utility in, in um, sparing uh, the chemotherapy up front. So um, what studies are in development? This is not the lung map, lung map trial. Um, so these are, uh, so there's a CTP proposal that's looking at amivantinib and lazertinib um, in patients with uh, stage four recurrent EGFR mutated or treatment naive. And then these two here are very, very early. So they haven't yet even gone to triage yet. Uh, carbotaxol plus Pembro um, alone or in combination with RAM or ipilimumab in stage four recurrent or recurrent squamous cell. Um, lung cancer, uh, and then this is a is a neoadjuvant chemo IO uh, trial. Um, I will speak briefly about the lung map trial. As you know, this is an umbrella protocol that continues to grow. We have active biomarker driven sub sub studies right now. As the nineteen hundred E, it's Amgen five ten and Ras G twelve C. Um, patients and then the non-match active study is a uh, is 1800D, which is this IL-15 uh, plus Pembro uh, versus standard of care um, in, in that. And then the proposed sub-studies right now, uh, there's one for carbopem with or without sulpercatinib in RET fusion positive patients, 1900G, which is osimertinib and kepmatinib with or without RAM in patients with MET amplification, EGFR mutated patients after prior OC. So this is uh, to, to, to tackle MET amplification as a resistance mechanism. Um, S1900H, tapotinib and ramsirumab in patients with previously treated MET exon 14. Uh, and there's actually a S1900I, uh, which is mobicertinib um, plus or minus ramsirumab, I believe. So that is, but I wanted to give you a big sort of overview of what's happening and then just leave a few um, uh, minute, minutes for, for questions or, or comments about uh, those, any trials in particular or just you know, engagement and barriers, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Chen. There's already a question in the chat. Um, Sandy Reese is asking whether patient recruitment has been modified by COVID and, and how and how you guys are overcoming that. Well, I think everybody in this room knows that patient uh, recruitment has been modified by COVID uh, at individual institutions that I've spoken to my colleagues at. I think we're coming out of it. 
Uh, I think we've learned a lot from, honestly, um, you know, being a little more lax as Dr. Unger uh, brought up some of those points around, um, and Dr. Segaro, uh, around eligibility and, and um, uh, you know, uh, telehealth and, and being just a little more flexible about these things. Um, I think that, um, unfortunately, clinical trial staff uh, issues across the nation are, are still pretty significant, uh, but but I think everybody is starting to 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 come back, uh, and and we're seeing more accruals. Good, great question. We are going to move on with our next presentation. Thank you so much. We have um, the pleasure of having another. Uh, SWOG leader as one of our um, presenters, uh, Dr. Ian Thompson. It's a pleasure that you're joining us today. He's a professor and he's chairman of the urology division at the University of Texas uh, Health Sciences Center in San Antonio. He is the chair of the GU committee here at SWOG. He uh, is a member of the NCI steering committee. He serves in leadership positions at the American Urological Association, clearly a champion here at SWOG highly committed to um, our mission here in the Latin American team. He actually even offered to give this presentation in Spanish. We actually asked him to do it in English, but but thank you so much, Dr. Thompson, for, for agreeing to, to join us today. Well, thank you and muy buenos dias uh, uh, to everyone. It's nice to uh, be back in person after two years of being apart and it's good to see so many good friendly faces over the years. Um, Many things we could talk about because in the context of diversity and clinical trials, there are so many opportunities and maybe I, I'm going to try to put this together very, very briefly, but if there is a take home message is that uh, I would suggest that in times of challenge, there are also great opportunities. And so as we think about from a clinical trials accrual standpoint and diversity, which is not really the focus of my talk, as we have had the great resignation among our CRAs at our institutions. I sit on um, EABs for cancer centers and I have told cancer center directors that as you have folks that leave to go to pharma, it's a great opportunity to train your own. And if there were ever a great time to train folks that are fluent in Spanish, it's now the time to do so. We published a paper about uh, eight or nine years ago looking at all phase threes in cancer conducted in the United States. And we found out that as, the, as a former cancer center director, oftentimes we were challenged living in a city like San Antonio where we have a majority minority population. In fact, it's not uncommon that we'll have conversations in Spanish in virtually every part of the center and in the city that our cancer accrual amongst Hispanics was lower than the fraction of the population. And many of you may not be aware that the main reason for that is the demographics, that Hispanics in the United States are younger. And as a result, when they move into the cancer age in the years to come, we will see more, unfortunately, more cancers in that, in that population. But when we looked at phase threes in the United States, the total participation rate, my recollection, was about two and a half percent in phase threes in the United States are uh, Hispanic or Latinx, as opposed to the population in the United States. We have much to do. There has been a lot of focus on um, other groups, but there is much to do from a cancer standpoint uh, amongst uh, Hispanics. My, my focus is to ask you to seriously consider becoming more involved in the GU committee. Um, this is the GU committee. Um, it's actually five committees, maybe six, because I should put NCOR down here and that's not the updated slide compared to what I'm gonna give at the plenary tomorrow, but we have Bladder and that's Seth Lerner and Tom Flake. Um, huge number of activities in, in Bladder. Renal, Brian Suchuk and, and Ulsa, Ulsa, Ulka Vashampayan are our organ site chairs. Um, prostate, Dan and Tanya, and Tanya is also, along with Olka, are the chairs of our DEI subgroup within SWAG that on, and I forgot to bring it with me, 
But if you flip to about page five of your agenda booklet, you will see that we have a DEI symposium that's not just GU, it's for everyone. It's at noon on Saturday. Those of you who are attending virtually, please consider joining. It's really an all-star cast that um, charges all of us within SWOG to be responsive. Cancer control, we also have an amazing uh, translational medicine group and David is going to be speaking later on today at the plenary on the GUTM trials. Um, and I like to, I always like to quote uh, JFK that this is the most astonishing collection of talent. He was referring to a group of Nobel laureates at the White House since Thomas Jefferson died, dined here alone. It's a really talented group of people. And I would encourage you to participate because um, I've been participating in SWAG for 40 years. I joined as a very junior, junior, junior person. And I was given the opportunity as I was finishing my fellowship when I asked the then chair of the GU committee, I said, how is it that you can determine whether or not adjuvant radiotherapy is given for pathologically advanced prostate cancer after a radical prostatectomy? You can determine whether it's given based upon the institution uh, where the patient was treated. How can that be? And he said, you can write your own phase three. We did that. And it was um, a very successful phase three, only through SWOG. And the way to get involved is to participate. And we have a substantial number of mentors. All of these folks um, really focus on mentoring the next generation. We have an entire um, um, infrastructure on building young investigators. And we would love to have young investigators who have a focus on diversity, focus on a broader inclusion of the patient population in the United States. What have we done? Our entire one singular focus, well, there's others, but the singular focus is changing the standard of care. And we have done so. The original BCG trials that changed the treatment for superficial high risk uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We changed the treatment of those patients from cystectomy to bladder, uh, bladder um, uh, salvage. Cytoreductive nephrectomy, when I was a, res uh, a resident taking my oral boards, if I told the examiner that the treatment for advanced uh, kidney cancer was to remove the kidney and give systemic therapy concurrently, I would have been sent back to my residency program until we determined that it was the standard of care. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute, we're re-examining it because that was in the context of, believe it or not, interferon. Now we have IO. We don't know whether in the era of immunotherapy, whether you still need to do a cytoreductive nephrectomy or whether it may actually lead to inferior outcomes. Docetaxel, we helped get it registered by the Food and Drug Administration. I spent 30 some odd years of my career treating patients with advanced prostate cancer only with hormones. And docetaxel was the first agent determined to actually improve overall survival. Adjuvant gemcitabine after resection of bladder tumors, intermittent versus continuous. I mean, most of these were New England Journal publications our original combined androgen deprivation trials and so forth and so on. And not to mention, uh, there's several people in the room that helped participate in the prostate cancer prevention trial and in select. I mean, even today you can go to Walmart and you can buy a, a prostate supplement that includes vitamin E. It causes prostate cancer. So it's astonishing. And now we have a standard of care for papillary renal cell carcinoma. We have TM um, um, studies that are, and I'm gonna show you a list for our, we have a monthly um, uh, a leadership call where we review our ongoing studies. Uh, the TM studies that are ongoing, there's about 30 or 35 of them, multiple R01s that are going to be included in PO1s. Circulating tumor counts predict prostate cancer outcomes. ADT associated with a number of adverse outcomes. Um, we have uh, uh, data that would suggest that ADT is associated with cognitive dysfunction, increased risk of Alzheimer's, and there is a PO1 that's being built based upon that. 
And then all of the PCBT findings, we have fundamentally changed the management of prostate cancer in terms of detection and prevention as a result. So there are a bunch of studies that are closed awaiting results. And some of these things are a little bit closer to in terms of results. Adjuvant Everolimus for renal cell carcinoma, uh, that was closed. And this is a fascinating one. So the other aspect of the GU committee, so no matter what your discipline, please join, join us. We have surgeons, we have medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, pathologists, radiologists, pharmacists, you name it, we have folks that are participating. And many of those have leadership posi positions. And in fact, one of the measures that we include and when we have our requests for proposals for new clinical trials, is it multidisciplinary? Because the real power of SWAG is we are a multidisciplinary organization. So even if you are potentially not in GU and you have some ideas on how your discipline can improve the management or change the standard of care for GU, come join us. So this is an example, pelvic lymph node dissection at the time of cystectomy. A brief anecdote, we may not get through all of this, that's fine when your thing will take questions, but fascinating in gastric and pancreatic cancer, I'm not sure whether you all are aware of this, that there were a number of uh, observational studies that suggested that a wider node, lymph node dissection at the time of surgery was associated with improved outcomes. Same thing has occurred over the last 15 years in urology, suggesting that the further you go up in the abdomen at the time of your lymph node dissection in these frail, elderly, generally heavy smokers with concurrent cardiovascular disease for whom there is a three to 5% 90-day mortality and about a 45% risk of, of um, readmission afterwards, that the more you, that you do at the time of the surgery, the better the outcomes. In pancreatic and gastric, we subsequently found out that it did not improve survival and all it did was improve, was uh, increase the risk of complications. We have exactly the same, one minute left, so I won't make it through all of this. Um, we have trials that are open and are accruing. You don't really need to know that, but there are a number of studies where uh, there, every institution in the world should be able to participate. One that you're probably well aware of is uh, Brian Chapin's trial, asking the question whether or not treatment of the primary makes a difference in the context of advanced disease. Everybody in every institution in the world um, can give hormone therapy, can do surgery, can remove the prostate or give radiation for prostate cancer. So every potential institution can, partici can participate in 1802. Uh, we have a number of trials that are in development. Um, I'm just gonna, so the opportunities for involvement, participate in trial accrual, uh, participate in discussions at the group meetings, please come and join us. 38% of the 254 members of our committee have a leadership role in the committee. So there's a lot of opportunities for this. We want young investigator TM champions. This is our current matrix for the other cooperative group trials. Look at the names of all the champions and we have constantly new trials that are participating. And so a young person who's interested in participating can be the advocate for an ECOG trial or another group's clinical trial within SWOG develop a relationship for this broad group of individuals and participate. Here's our list of TM projects. And then just as a unabashedly um, selfish or self-centered, we have our radiation oncology uh, symposium on the management of, of uh, oligometastatic uh, 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 prostate cancer. So are actually all, all oligometastatic diseases. And the second one is our DEI symposium on, on Saturday. We use these symposia to determine what the future looks like, just like the NCI has symposia to determine what their RFAs, RFPs will look like in the future. Thank you questions. so much. We may not have time for No questions. time for questions? Grab me after. Well, if, John, if John has a question, I guess, he, he trumps, yeah, he, he, he trumps the, the tight timeline. He, he breaks, <laughs> he breaks <laughs> the rules. Exceptions have to be made. <laughs> I appreciate that.
So this is a comment. Um, Ian will relate to it, but it's really for all four of these presentations. So if we're really serious about filling up the buckets with minority approval, we can actually make it a requirement that we actually fill up the bucket instead of just making it a goal. As you remember, Ian, in Select, we tried very, very hard to recruit African-Americans who are, of course, at high risk for prostate cancer. We came close, but we didn't quite reach our goal. PCPT, and then Select. And then Select. PCPT, we did not do very well. Select, we did better. At one point, I asked the National Cancer Institute, who was pushing us like crazy, will you let us keep the trial open until we accrue the right mm. number of African Americans? Simple solution. And they said, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think a, a, a very good take home uh, has to, for this, from that was the prostate cancer prevention trial. We had an entire structure. So that was 18,000 subjects to be recruited. We actually over recruited, but we had an entire minority recruitment committee. Remember Carol Moynpour helped ran that? We had an enormous amount of effort to increase the accrual of African-Americans. I think it was 5%. It was dismal failure, despite an enormous effort. What we did in select, which was 34,000 subjects, is we purposely selected institutions that had a greater African-American population, specifically VAs. And I think it was pretty close. It was like 14% versus 15%. So you have to be intentional about that recruitment. You know, you'd like to be able to do that, um, but you know, in, in prevention trials, money trumps everything, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. And as you said, I think a lot of these symposium really help us, you know, like define where are we heading? And these are very key conversations that we need to continue having. Now, in order to be also fully inclusive and give the podium to to member of our, um, you know, international sites, this, this uh, meeting, it's the role of Chile. So Dr. Retamales, it's going to start um, talking about his side, Dr. Uh, Javier Retamales, it's a radio oncologist in um, Santiago de Chile. He works at the Institution, Instituto Nacional de Cancer. He's the executive director of GOCHI. GOCHI, it's the um, national cooperative group uh, specializing in oncology in Chile. He's our PI. He actually has been awarded with the SWOG YIA, I believe, 2020. Um, he's yet to come to spend that time uh, here for the training since it all got kind of like paused by the pandemic, but he'll be back and he's, he's a force in Chile. So Dr. Retamales, tell us you know, a little bit about what's happening over there so everybody can get to know more about your site. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. A lot of friendly faces. Finally, I can see you. Uh, I didn't really know how to do this presentation because first time we were doing and they put me on, on me to be the lab rat. <laughs> so what I'm really trying to show you is what is for us the value of, the, of a clinical trials. For patients, the value of a clinical trial can be living more, living better, or hopefully both of them. For the sponsor, the value of a clinical trial can be a cost-effective uh, treatments. But for sites, the value of a clinical trial can be a great zone, at least, at least in Chile. For example, what I'm talking about of a great zone, when you compare the academic research with pharma research, in Chile, pharma, pharma research is more abundant than academic research because for some sites, or oh, one of the reason is that for the, for the sites participating in the pharma trials, the participation in the pharma trials involves direct funding. So what that means? That means that, for example, an MRI, a brain MRI for the trial S1847, um, the public insurance can pay, pay for the patients to decide like over a hundred of dollars. If the patient has no insurance at all, the center, the MRI center can, uh, can cost can, uh, $200. But if a pharma clinical trial is starting at that site, 
that site can cost over $1,000 for the same MRI. So this, there's a difference on how a, how a site is uh, being reimbursed by the direct funding of pharma clinical trials. So we don't want to show resources. We don't want, want to really be being stuck with the budget. And for doing that, we need to show how different this initiative is for pharma trials. For example, getting this, this graph, it's really something that, that has a lot of impact in people, how so saves lives. So in order to participate, we need to show where the value of our research is. The value for, for Chile participating in SWOG trial is it's a lot of things. New staff incorporating to research, new centers participating. We're talking about public ho hospitals that are not really involved in research, now are being involved in research thanks to SWOG. New, proposal, new proposals of new researchers, a new multidisciplinary work. As, as uh, Dr. Thompson said, uh, we have different people, even if, if not the same specialty, we have different people participating in different trials. And we want, really want to show to the sites is collaborative research is opposed in that way to a competitive research. We're not competing who is enrolling more patients. We are collaborating in how open more sites or how, and how we can enroll more patients. This is the most important thing for me in Gochi because when people at sites see the value of the research, now it's time they call for action. The action for clinical trials activation in Chile involves a regulatory process. I'm not going to go in deep in this. The commissioning and training, We've, uh, we've been really involved with all the sites, uh, uh, working with them, being in the sites to work with them with the commissioning. In, for this, in, for the S1802, we are trying to participate. And also be, uh, on the S1914, and this is the ultrasound for the S1501. Uh, the second part or third part, I don't remember, are agreements. Uh, we need to do agreements with sites because we have a, pay, uh, a budget uh, per patient in CDSU, but the site uh, ask, uh, ask us for uh, activities. So we need to dissect the per patient payment into interventions of the sites. And so in that way, we can cover all the interventions that are not covered in our health system. Uh, we have, as, as, as I told you previously, we're working with sites that not, were not participating in clinical trials in the past. So for example, biobanking has been a really, a really issue for us. So for that, we, uh, we, uh, uh, we have an agreement now with the biobanking of University of Chile. So we're doing the translational part, the processing of the samples as the storage in the, in the biobank of the University of Chile. But there are costs we're still trying to cope. For example, commissioning cost. Uh, you are seeing here a really classic radiotherapy plan for the brain, whole brain uh, radiation therapy. And even if the study is 1827, allow us to do this kind of plan. We still have to commissionate the most complicated technique. We don't really use that technique in Chile for most of the patients that we want to enroll of that, of, on, on that study, but we still have to commissionate that technique and that's expensive, requires time and requires money for the, the broker of the phantom. Uh, for example, this is the commissioning for the ultrasound of the S1501. That's a heart, right? You just can see the heart like. But for us in Latin America, patients are different. And this is an example of the ultrasound of, of some patient. The ultrasound really don't looks good. So there are, it's, a, it's, a, it's a barrier to overcome. Uh, one thing the academist told us was, what about doing MRI? Looks better. That would be a very good thing for us. There are intersite costs, uh, shipping samples from Chile to, to here in the US is very cost, costly. And it 
it being for us shipping samples every three months cost over two thousand dollars so the less we can ship the sample the best for us even if we have some reports of overdue of shipping samples we are working still working on that uh, so has been very very good with us very um compassive i don't know <laughs> yeah they don't really uh been too hard on us and there's some milestones. There's a lot of milestones we are completed so far. For example, the validation of the clinical trials, the validation of the SBRT technique, that's been a really huge deal in Chile. In Chile, that was the first time a center in the whole country commissioned in the most compli complicated technique of radiotherapy. And we did that on a public hospital on Saturday, you know? just for, for some beers. We didn't have to pay for them. <laughs> um, we have been working with uh, different uh, other things that in Chile are important. For example, we arranged with Roche to, to have a policy, uh, uh, insurance policy for patients participating in S1914 that uh, is required for Chile and so allowed us to negotiate directly with Roche. And now we have an insurance policy for them. And we even had been developing our own software. I don't know if kind of software or, or something like that. We, you can pay, put the randomization date in the in this uh, spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet calculates not only the visit but also the window visit. And we are doing this for every trial because in the protocol it says like you have to see the the calendar, and that was a lot of a lot of pressure, a lot of work. Now we're doing this and it's working very, very nice. And so research for me, it's a lot of things. Collaborative research changed the history of medicine. We're doing better stuff with this. Uh, SWOG is saving the lives of millions of patients, not only the patients participating in the clinical trials, but also all the patients that are benefiting for the from the, the, the experience of the, the more capacitation in their centers. And collaborative research through SWOG means direct opportunities. Opportunities for us to participate, opportunities for new researchers to, to contribute, to be part of this initiative, to use secondary data analysis, translational medicines. A, a lot of sites is making a, a lot of noise in Chile. A lot of sites are asking to participate in SWOG. And uh, for me, this is saving my life too. So thank you, muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Retamales. I think what, what you guys have done in Chile, it's really extraordinary. Um, he's so committed to overcoming obstacles. Um, there's, there's a lot of issues with these phantoms. Um, it's costly, it's hard to get them shipped. He wants these phantoms so bad. He had through Dacia, get me to pick up the phantoms in Houston and travel with this massive box all the way here. And now he's gonna take it to Chile. So, so you know, this is the creativity of the Latinos that we're just trying to, to make things happen. Um, Thank you. I don't know if anybody has any um, comments. Um, if not, we will move to the second part of the agenda where very rapidly, very fast, we want each one of the sites to give us a little bit of an update about what's happening there. Each site, it's gonna prepare this in a different way, whether they're talking about their plans, whether they're talking about their challenges, whether they're talking about what they're more uh, interested in. So we're just moving quickly the agenda a little bit. Um, so since Dr. Retamales is here already, we'll start um, with Chile very briefly, if you can give us an update on, on your site. Okay, thank you. As, as you know this, we in Gochi, we are an NGO like, uh, like SWOG, so we work with sites. We are not a site per se. So we have uh, sites, uh, two sites open so far, the Instituto Nacional del Cancer and Hospital Sodero del Rio. We, we, uh, we have in the roster uh, Bettina Miller, our president, uh, Ingi Borgaraya, who is in, in charge of S1714. And we incorporated two other new investigators, uh, Natalia Jara for the uh, radiation oncologist for the S1918-02, uh, and for the S1914, and Ann Walton, the urology uh, oncologist for the S1802. 
and in Hospital Sodero del Rio, I'm working there with uh, Ignacio Salazar, medical oncologist, and Jose Arenas, urology oncology. So we are really looking forward to open the S1802 and the S1827 and the S, uh, I, you know, that. Uh, the trials we're participating, we are we enrolled 10 patients uh, for S1714. Uh, we have, uh, we take, it, it took us a long of time to enroll for that trial. Uh, I don't know if you all know this, but in, in the, for the sites, in order to participate, we need a state department approval, and it, that uh, took us like over a year uh, because the, uh, every time we are sending the, the documents they need, they up, uh, updated them and we have to do it again with the new, uh, you know, the new documents. So it was tough, but hopefully we are going to be able to enroll pretty soon more patients for the other trials uh, because we enrolled 10 patients like in, I don't know, three or four months. So I think we are really looking forward to participate. The S1802, we succeed in credentialing. So we, this protocol is already in the ethical committee. So we hope, we hope we can enroll patients soon. And for the S1827 and the S1914, we'll start credentialing. And you know, that's, once, uh, that's one of the difficulties we are, I was trying to talk to you because for example, for the s 1827, we could really do a very simple plan, radiotherapy plan for those patients. But the, the issue that we need to address for the, this trial is that we, we need to commission the more difficult technique for brain radiotherapy. So we need that fund for that. Um, that that's been an issue in all Latin America. So, um, I think uh, 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 things are going to be easier if we, we can participate for the trials uh, in future with more initiatives that address that kind of barriers. Uh, for S1501, we are credentialing in process. It's already submitted for ethical committee. Uh, and for that trial, uh, we have one site that uh, passed the credentialing and another site is having an issue with the transmission of the images. We really don't know. I talked last week with AG MedNet a lot of time and they still don't know what's happening because they don't see the, the ultrasound uh, moving. They have look still, I don't know, but hopefully <laughs> it's going to be an issue from the past soon. And in, on TIMIST, we start credentialing um, for SLA01. We'll be submitting uh, to the EC as soon as protocol is ready. Um, for the S2013, it's already submitted for ethical committee. So we're really looking forward to participate in all of these trials. Uh, the ethical committee process is taking longer than usual because of the pandemics. And because it was February, and uh, February, the ethical committee is closed but we hopefully being able to open all these different trials very, very soon. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, great progress. We're gonna continue with uh, our colleagues from Colombia, Dr. Acosta that you all know, he's been involved with SWOG for, for many, many years. Uh, it's gonna give us a, a brief update of the activities in Colombia. Thank you, Dr. Chavez. Good morning, everybody. I uh, feel grateful to see, see you again, see uh, many uh, friendly <clears throat> faces. Uh, first of all, I apologize for my rudimentary English, but I am sure you can understand me. Uh, this is our institution. We uh, not only are a hospital, with care patients. Uh, we also have some of many research activities and training uh, of human talent. We have uh, specialities of almost all uh, oncological specialties. 
and uh, we development uh, with the public health minister uh, actions in public health. Uh, regarding our um, research activities, uh, the institutes the institute has organized uh, this in eight different lines of uh, research, and at uh, the last of the at the end of the last year, uh, we have uh, more than uh, about uh, 190 uh, different uh, trial projects. Uh, with so with uh, ha we have only seven projects, uh, some with the pharmaceutical industries, and uh, we have about almost uh, 200 different projects uh, with without uh, pharmaceutical uh, activities. Uh, this uh, is uh, our projects with SOG. The uh, first uh, three are closed uh, to a cruel, and the others uh, we are uh, awaiting for uh, start accrual activities. We have some barriers. Uh, Dr. Retamales uh, told about uh, some of that. For example, we need uh, an IROT certification. <laughs> we are working hard, but uh, we uh, hope uh, we uh, will be able to uh, overcome these uh, administrative uh, difficulties. Uh, currently, the Institute are leading uh, our uh, national uh, network of cancer research. Uh, one of our goals is to uh, adapt and adopt the SWOG structure for our network. Uh, because a uh, SWOG structure is very, very uh, suitable uh, with our health uh, public system and uh, our network. Uh, we need to uh, conform, uh, for example, different specialties committees and the uh, uh, way to uh, approve our trials, trials is uh, very, very uh, similar to SWOG uh, structure. Uh, we made a lot of uh, meetings with our surgical and medical special specialists, and these are the interest in uh, investigation uh, for these uh, people. And some of them are uh, sharing with SWOG uh, structure, for example, hereditary cancers, uh, biomolecular uh, research, and some of uh, quality of life uh, trials, we could participate on it. Uh, we know we have a lot of uh, obstacles, a lot of barriers, not only economical barriers, uh, but also, for example, the interest of uh, pharmaceutical uh, research is different for our needs in, in research. Uh, but uh, also, on the other hand, we have a lot of strengths. Uh, it's easy to accrue uh, participants because uh, we have reduced cost, less uh, compensation for patient recruitment. Uh, we have an heterogeneous uh, genetic makeup, and it's not only for our country, but also for other Latin American uh, countries. In conclusion, uh, National Cancer Institute leading and improve our cancer research uh, networks. We need to continue improving training for clinical investigation. Uh, we need to streamline uh, processes with IRB, IRB publications and paid protected research time. Uh, on behalf of uh, SWOG, we uh, wait uh, to uh, continue to facilitate uh, facilitate LA participation in clinical trials and to continue helping in training research. This is our uh, SWOG team. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Dr. Acosta. Great, great uh, um, presentation and a lot of opportunities. Uh, next, we have uh, Mexico in representation of Dr. Paula Cabrera, who's the PI who couldn't be with us, is Dr. Mora, who has been a pioneer and a great um, connection between SWOG and the rest of the Latin American side. So thank you, Dr. Mora. First of all, thank you for your invitation to participate here right now. Um, good morning to everybody. It's good to see you in person again. It's, uh, we're happy to, to see you each other in person. We, we lost the mouse. No. Okay. I don't know if maybe uh, our like so that, IT. Is, is there a text? Yeah, but we cannot There's find no it. Mouse. Yeah. The mouse is gone. Uh-oh. We cannot find it. Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Oh, God. Hello. Okay, thank you. You guys see Dr. Retamara somehow kind of always saves the day. Okay, I still don't see it. It's in the other screen. So the, the other screen is supposed to be over here. So if you push it that way. That way? Uh -huh. oh, I see a mouse. Okay, so I can't see where I am. So that screen is supposed to be to your right. So if you move all the way to the left, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, more and more. Thank you. We need to open this, but I can't, it's not showing up. It's in a shop. So. There it is. In number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now, no. well, something happened there. No, we need to click. Escape? No, no, no. We need to click the um, yeah, big no, screen. But the problem is. Well, you want to, you want to start slideshow first. Well, yeah, it is. There so, it is. There it is. There it is. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, the National Cancer Institute in Mexico. Uh, this is our institute. This is a great staff uh, working with SWOG already. Uh, these are uh, the physicians who are really eager to, to participate in protocol, so, uh, in SOC protocols. Uh, we, we have them already by department, so they're uh, doing a great effort to participate in these protocols. And of course, Dr. Paula Cabrera is a PI for all this team. Uh, we, we have these, these protocols. Uh, uh, we, are, we already have two uh, pro to, um, pro um, protocols active. It's 1802, which we are about to start participating. Uh, we also have uh, impact protocol, uh, which is already active, but we are waiting for the surgeon's uh, certification or creden credentialization. So um, we are just about to start with this participation. Uh, we have uh, already participated in five protocols and uh, we, we have had a good participation in these protocols, as you can see. So um, I think we, every time we have a good opportunity to participate, we can uh, have a good participation in these protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are about to open uh, to get these, these protocols activated, like uh, 1827, the 2013, the TMIST protocol, and the SLA uh, 01. Uh -huh. And we are interested in, in two of them, the auricular, auricular acupressure and the 2010. Uh, so as soon as we, we have these protocols, we will be working and activating them. Uh, the future we can see at the Institute with SWOG is that uh, we can strengthen the importance of keeping participating with uh, SWOG among 
the, med the medical community are in can. We are trying to involve uh, more physicians and more uh, residents so that they, they get more interested in, in these kind of protocols. Mm -hmm. uh, seek the implementation of protocol proposals in SWOG that provide knowledge and improve treatment in the most frequent types of cancer in Mexico that could be applicable in the United States, as, as all, all the, the previous uh, speakers have, uh, have talked about, uh, uh, there is a need to, to include more minority population. So this is a good chance for us, uh, for everybody, including us, like uh, as Latinos, uh, to, to participate in these protocols. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we need to keep working in festival SWOG protocols at, at INCAN. We would like, we would love to work in all protocols, but due to some barriers, it's not feasible for us. So uh, we, are, we keep looking uh, for the feasible protocols to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to Im improve our participation in diverse SWOG uh, uh, committees. So uh, we already have two of these uh, physicians working in, in committees, in SWOG committees, and uh, we, we will be increasing our participation in them. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we, we have always talked uh, about the barriers we have and they are, they are the same <laughs> and even a little bit more uh, due to pandemic and due to uh, a different structure, uh, uh, the different structure we are having right now in Mexico with the government. Uh, so uh, we are having some changes we are, uh, which are uh, having, a, that's why we are having a difficulty to, to have advances as we would like to, such as Coffee Priest, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's all. Uh, this is the, the name of. Oh, just in time. Just <laughs> in time. Just in time. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to continue with Peru. Uh, Dr. Payet, the director of the National Cancer Institute in Peru, couldn't be here, but it's our pleasure that Dr. Fuentes is here to present uh, on behalf of Peru. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you. You're good now. Okay. You're ready. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm gonna show you uh, my institution. This is Instituto Nacional de Enfermedades Neoplásicas from Lima, Peru. It's over uh, 80 years that it's established in Peru. This is not all, all, it's working on diagnosis, treatment and rehabilitation of people in our country with cancer and works with Ministry of Health in developing public policies and national leadership of cancer prevention and conduct coordination with this institution. Our center uh, had the first uh, resident program in Latin America in uh, the 30s. And since that, uh, we are institution trends in university institutions, not only from Peru, but uh, also from other countries. This is a structure of our institution. We have all the specialties, not only medical oncology, surgery, and radiotherapy. This is the new cases per year in our institutions uh, in cervical and breast cancer, over 1,000 new cases per year in only our institution. This is all the pro protocols approved by institutional ethics committees. Um, actually, uh, we have passed the audit of the FDA uh, last week from a protocol of uh, biosimilar in subcutaneous administration for a drug of breast cancer. Uh, now we have uh, 51 studies remain active, most of them uh, of pharmaceutical of clinical trials. But uh, we have uh, observational um, protocol of our institution. 
well, we have a lot of strategic alliance. And these are the, the most important now working with our institution. Uh, we have a lot of transnational research because we have some barriers to have uh, interventional uh, works as mentioned uh, for me, with my other colleagues. These are a, a protocol with Andy Anderson, Mofos Den of Breast Cancer, uh, University of Vanderbilt with Dr. Arteaga, see, triple negative breast cancer, neodjuvants and, and residual disease, and not only medical oncology, but also in uh, surgery of surgical minimal invasive versus abdominal radical hysterectomy for uh, cervical cancer. And with uh, IRD of France, we have a lot of uh, investigation of hepatocarcinome because of a publication of one uh, hepato hepatic surgery that found that have a, a, a unique presentation in our country. Yes. So, uh, uh, IRD have uh, a collaboration with our institution to uh, make an, an investigation of this disease. And um, finally, we have two uh, networks coordination, one of them with the Sarcoma European Latin America Multidisciplinary Team and with the University of Heidelberg um, of uh, concern, Eradicate Preventable Colbrader Cancer. The local uh, transnational investigator allowed, allowed us to uh, found or to get found about grants to buy all the equipment that have, because the government didn't have found to uh, give us equipment for our institution. So we have grants to uh, to buy all of that, all that equipment, cost all the student for the external external funds. So uh, we have, uh, in the last years, uh, this participation in SWOC, 13, uh, S1316 with five patients, and S1617-14 with health difficulties of recruitment for a uh, pandemic. The opportunities of a collaboration with our institution and SWOC, yes, provide, in end, provide a state-of-art medical care surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy for cancer patients due to the high burden of disease in the country and high volume of patients that I show you. At Miregar in end, this institution is a strategic position to perform high quality research in the field of cancer. The collaboration on knowledge and technology transfer will improve the quality of research in cancer that may lead to breakthrough knowledge. Novel techniques, agents, methodologies, models, or application that will eventually impact on the patient care. Uh, the opportunities are set up a translational cancer research unit, because uh, we have a, a tissue biobank, uh, we have the equipment, and we had uh, excellent medical staff dedicated to research. Uh, the clinical research that we can do in our institution, institution uh, uh, clean, uh, studies of quality of life, epidemiology, observationals, and some interventional trials uh, because we have some barriers. So bringing a high standard research entity to an institution with a high volume of patients and a high standard of medical care, we create an environment to accelerate current research of the molecular biology and target treatment for the disease. Thank you very much. Dr. Fuentes, thank you. We're really looking forward to okay. continue to re-engage with, with Peru and, and um, see more activity in our relationship. Now, as uh, most of you know, we have two new uh, sites, uh, Your Way and Brazil. So this is also an official welcome uh, for you all to our first in-person meeting that you get to be here. And on behalf of Uruguay, we have Dr. Lira, who's going to present and tell us a little bit about the plans uh, for, for Uruguay. Okay, so thank you very much for this kind invitation. I would like to uh, present what Uruguay is doing right now and so far. So, first of all, I would like to let you know that Uruguay, or, or at least in, 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 in our university, we're working in this UHN, University Health Network Pathway, 
where is based on Hospital de Clinicas and also the National Cancer Institute. So we have two institutions working together like uh, under this uh, university umbrella. So it's very important for me to, to let you know this uh, situation because the, the capacity of recruitment is uh, in, improved with this uh, situation. So, so far, we're working hard to try to find uh, and fill the spots and, and gain more positions in different uh, committees, okay? So at this moment, Dr. Mauricio Cuello, who's here and is our PI, is enrolled in the lung cancer committee. And myself, I'm uh, already uh, enrolled and approved in the gastrointestinal uh, committee. However, this is just the beginning and we are trying to find other spots for our researchers. And uh, we are trying to involve not just the solid tumors and we would like to get involved also the mythology team and try to create uh, and improve our, a very strong team where everyone may help and, 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 and gain more experience and, and, and bring more, more studies. So, so far the ongoing or active projects where the truth is are, the list is very, very short, but this is just the beginning. Okay, so let's go one step at a time. We don't want to rush and try to find uh, and say yes to every single thing. We are trying to be very, very realistic and trying to be like a more like a, uh, trying to find the best uh, the, the best study that fits with our, with our knowledge. So the the number one is the the breast the, the, uh, the team is, and at this moment at this moment where we are where we are in the process of uh, quality assessments. Okay, so things are moving slow, but thankfully are moving in the right direction. And the number two, the S2013, is waiting already uh, the IRC approval. It was already sent. So hopefully we will get some news during the next few weeks, okay? So things are moving. So maybe not as fast as we desire, but things are moving. Uh, interest in, part in participate. Well, we do have an uh, interest in participating in two, two studies, the S2010 from the breast uh, committee and already the interest was, uh, form was already filled and, and sent. And the S1802 from the uh, EU committee, well, same situation, okay? The form was already filled and sent. Hopefully we will Gain, we will have uh, some reply from, from, from the, the committees and hopefully we will be able to join these, uh, th those studies. So our proposals, uh, we are trying, we are motivating our, our, our physicians, our, our investigators, even when they are waiting for this uh, approval uh, to, to join the, the committees, the, 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 the official approval to, to, to join the committees to think about proposals. They don't need to be like, a, or offer the biggest idea or something like very, very, the newest uh, situation because well, sometimes it's difficult to, to put on the ground in Latin America, all it, it, the, like a therapeutic ideas. Maybe we just need to go one step at a time. Let's go with the small ideas, uh, interact with the rest of the teams, the committees, and maybe we can offer something that it's important, it's relevant, and we can, everybody can, 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 can pull a, a different piece and we can uh, form a very nice and, and, and well-formed puzzle where we can, everybody can, can gain and form something very interesting. So at this time, we are trying to discuss immunotherapy prescription in Latin America, but this idea thankfully changed. And right now we are thinking about something different where the S2013 could be like the, 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 the study where this idea will be based. And we can think about how are we prescribing chemotherapy in a pharmacoeconomic pharma point of view. So this is very, very important. And thankfully we are waiting just for communication for this committee. So the next steps and goals, well, we in Uruguay were trying to hire 
an exclusive CRA to develop and follow SWOG related issues and studies just for SWOG, because we need to do this in the right way. So we need to conclude enrollment for new investigators, as I said before, and propose to Uruguay investigators to join different SWOG committees to gain presence and open new opportunities. So this is where we are. We are a very, very young team in this regard, but we are more than happy to be here and we would like to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Dr. McGregor. Thank, thank you, you Dajin. I'm sure All right, be, thank you. I'm sure it's gonna be a, a very productive collaboration. So we're incredibly happy. And then the last uh, presentation we have from our colleagues in Brazil, they unfortunately could not be here. The PI, Dr. Gustavo Beruski, it's actually traveling. So Ms. Volker, it's uh, the um, chief CRA, she's going to present. And when we get all the um, AV um, stuff figured out, um, I just wanna thank you all for, for your engagement. We'll make sure that, that we finish at 12, 15, we'll just have a brief uh, open table. And I just wanna you know, call to all how you know we at some point had between in-person and virtual around 70 participants. So we were changing things, this is not a, invitation only meeting anymore we want to you know bring more and more people from song and bring our sites uh international sites out to the different committees so i don't know if we have brazil on so laura can you unmute and see if hi yeah. hi can you wow. can you hear me yeah <laughs> okay i'm sorry that i uh we were weren't able to to be with you in person but uh anyway it's great to to talk about LACOG and what we are doing so please, next slide. I'm Laura Felket. Just for your knowledge, I'm the head CRA in the, here, the chief CRA here at LACOG. Uh, this is um, this is our network at LACOG. We have um, 437 members at this at this moment uh, in 16 different countries in Latin America. So uh, this is uh, the idea of, of where they are. Okay, next, please. And um, our numbers uh, is, as I said, uh, we have 437 members in, in 60 countries, and these members uh, act in, in 200 institutions or, or hospitals or uh, sites, uh, research sites in, in Latin America. We have more than uh, 43 uh, studies uh, that we uh, performed though are uh, ongoing at this point and uh, with this study uh, with this studies we enrolled more than um, 1000 10, sorry 10000 and 700 uh, patients we have more than 90 uh, publications abstracts and articles published and uh, we have performed 20, uh, 20, uh, nine, uh, 29 uh, educational events at this moment next please uh, for your knowledge, we are uh, since we we received in the last uh, October our um, approval to of um, affiliation to to Swag Network. So we are very happy to 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 have this this approved and, and are eager to to start our participation. Next, please. We have at this point only one site affiliated to to the, our network. The, uh, this is the Hospital São Lucas, PUC. Uh, the site is in the south of Brazil. Uh, this, this is a, a hospital with um, more than 300 um, beds and more than 2,000 uh, physicians uh, working on it. Next, please. Um, and, uh, Within this, this hospital, we have the, the research center, which has conducted more than 300 uh, studies in, in clinical trials. And this, this site is the, one of the three, uh, uh, the three biggest uh, sites in, in Brazil. We, we have conducted uh, mainly phase three, phase three trials, but we have uh, performed, uh, conducted on other ones. Okay, please, next. Next, and yeah, okay. We have screened, uh, sorry, go back, please. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> We have more, uh, screened more than 3,000 uh, 3, patients and randomized uh, more, uh, almost 2,000 2, patients since uh, 96, okay? Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, of course, we, we want, no, no sorry, it, it's, it's, it's the delay with the, the go back, please. But, yeah. Uh, please go back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we we want to offer the opportunity for uh, the patient, uh, the cancer patients, to participate in the in the clinical trials run by by Swab Network. So we we want to stimulate other sites to join our network, and uh, we plan to include more two or three sites uh, in Brazil uh, by the end of 2022. The idea, uh, uh, you can go the, to the next slide, please. The idea we, is to participate in SLA01 study, and we are ev evaluating our participation in the S2010 study. Uh, of course, we have some challenges that we, we, we face in the, at the moment. The, um, the first one is that we have only one site affiliated to, to the network, and this, um, this could uh, lead us to a low recruitment depending on the study and the study design, and the tumor type. And the academic uh, model uh, related to, to budget, sometimes uh, it's not possible by regulation here, so we need to, to to check uh, case by case. Next, please. And uh, we have uh, we we are uh, discussing with the, the, the investigators to, to have Gustavo Verutsky, who is the, the, the CEO, CEO of LACOG, to, to participate in the breast cancer committee. And we are discussing with uh, Dr. William William to participate in lung cancer committee. We we intend to do that until the end of 2022, of course. And uh, we did not submit any, any study to, to, to SWOG yet at this moment, but we foresee uh, some economic issues to, to, to uh, run the studies, the, this kind of studies uh, in, as difference in standard of care and funding. Of course, we have the, the the issues with uh, the academic and uh, and covered of standard of care here. It's something that we we need to to check case by case, of course, as mentioned before. And um, to participate uh, in the studies, we are analyzing case by case because we have some flexibility, and uh, sometimes it depends on the the type of study we can we can do it, but uh, we we are evaluating case by case. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We, we're also looking forward to Brazil becoming very, very uh, active in, in SWOG. And I know that we're running a little bit behind for those from Latin America. It's not unusual, but we need to make sure that we finish on time. Um, so we have only about 10 minutes for, you know, as brief, um, open um, table of discussion. We will, of course, continue on those of this on, on a lot of those topics. You know, discussing internally. But something that we will want to do in the next few minutes is get to uh, hear from the sides, and of course, all the guests are invited to participate. But something that we wanted maybe to start with, it's talking about um, SLA01. That's our first. Um, SLA uh, study that we're um, getting support from the Hope Foundation, uh, where uh, a proposal for a very um, in-depth uh, profiling of gastric tumors is being proposed. I saw Dr. Uh, Ignacio Wistuba walking in the room. He has um, graciously and generously offered that his team at MD Anderson will do some of this analysis. So where we are right now is uh, we have a consent form ready. We have an updated 
protocol for minor minor revisions. It's pretty much ready. So we're we're kind of ready to go. So we would like to know maybe from the sites what are you know your next steps. I think we're ready to start submitting the protocols to IRB, and then maybe you all. Um, getting your samples together. I believe that Chile already has identified. I don't know if any of you want to step at the mic and maybe um, give us some, some thoughts. And always that's it. It's like more successful getting you guys to talk than me. So <laughs> we get to start with Chile. Yay. Very, very briefly uh, for the SLA01, we have uh, maybe two kinds of barriers. First, uh, most of the patients for the past uh, gastric cancer trials are dead. So we need to address that, how we can uh, ensure the, the ethical committees that those, those biological samples are to comply what the patients already signed on. Or maybe we can have a, like a, uh, some kind of document that allow us to use that samples, even if the patients are dead. Uh, for the uh, patients that are alive, we are trying to, to make a strategy to contact them because we are going to need to reconsent them. Uh, consenting other trials in the past uh, in the way that the patients were participating in those years, uh, we need to do a new informed consent to them. So that's what we are trying to work out now. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know maybe Mexico will work, Colombia will want to, you know, mention something in terms of um, the ready to start participating. Somebody, I don't know, in the phone. Um, we have, uh, hi, Dr. McGregor. Dr. Cabrera, Dr. Cabrera thank you. Your voice. No, no, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so sad to know be with you inside. I think Dr. Herrera is online. Maybe she can comment. As you know, she is hopefully uh, moving forward this trial in Mexico. I don't know, Dr. Herrera, if you can comment on. For those of you in the room, Dr. Maritel Herrera is a GI medical oncologist at uh, the NCI in Mexico, and she's going to be uh, taking on some leadership and moving this protocol forward. Maybe the, she has some connection issues, but maybe Dr. Mora can, can bring us an update of that tribe. We are very excited to work with you and Dr. Witsuba. Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. Dr. Mora is approaching the microphone. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you volunteer <Yeah>. her. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> So, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Herrera has been working on this protocol actively, so she already has uh, the new informed consent uh, format, and uh, we are uh, already working on submitting this final protocol to, to start participating, to start including patients, or well, the, the samples. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know if um, Dr. Lira, um, you guys have any thoughts about the possibility they will not participate? Okay. They'll reconsider. Yay. We we, we'll, that. Reconsidering is better than no. Okay. And and again, part part of the conversation about some of the barriers that we really have about you know challenges. Uh, but 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 thank you for reconsidering and, and finding ways. I don't know if maybe Colombia has anything to comment. I think there was something also related to the reconsenting maybe. Um, that had been. I know we have two issues about this protocol. One about the confidentiality of the The second is about the quality of the slides. Mm -hmm. I, I don't the know. size of the tumor yes. cuts in Colombia. Yeah, because, yeah. because we have a sample at the tumor bank, but I think these are two very important uh, ways to conserve the sample. You know, th this study um, was 
was proposed way before I was involved with the Latin America Initiative. And it's a very important study for us at SWOG. So also, you know, echoing, you know, Peru, Brazil in the phone to, to try to consider and engage in, because this, is a, this was a study proposed by Latin American investigators, right? Something that, that we uh, obtain funding through SWOG and that will help us uh, become relevant and show all the talent and the initiatives that, that we can have here. And of course, again, thank you to Dr. Wistuba for being so involved in it. I really think we may not have much time for, for additional discussion. There are some other important topics in terms of the possibility of activating um, the acupressure pilot um, that, that we've been discussing internally that we will bring to the forefront. Um, we have heard some uh, interest, I think Mexico, Chile, um, I don't know if anybody may have one is just say, you know, few, your way also a few words. It's, it's a small pilot and I think we, we can be, um, you know, sites for, for you. Um, any quick comments before we close and, and say some remarks, Dr. Mora? Doctor, Dr. Chavez, uh, we have the Dr. Moir who wants to send some regards. Perfect. We miss you, Dr. Moir. Thank you, uh, Mariana. Maybe some of you, I was before Mariana Chavez responsible of this wonderful team. And so I'm glad that Mariana Chavez took over and he's, she's doing a wonderful job. So I'm happy that you are mo much more uh, expanding this effort of SWOP. Just two brief comments, uh, Mariana, this study with Dr. Witsuba, exactly, I think it was even before I was involved in the SWOP, it, it was already running. So it's a good example of the uh, tenacious efforts of Latin America to do this, this, this project. So I'm very happy that finally is taking uh, place this study and I'm more than happy to continue collaborating as uh, investigator in the epidemiology and prevention committee in this wonderful team. So thank you again and congratulations to everybody for this huge effort. Y gracias Mariana for keeping up for Latin America and for Mexico also, bye bye now. Thank you, thank you. So, so again, the acupressure thing is something that we're very interested. We've heard some some positive thoughts. I mean, you have identified who you know the the team leaders that are present here are to continue engaging and maybe you know getting them at the at the end of the meeting. I know how important it's for all of us to leave the room at the time that they were supposed to finish. We'll continue discussions with all the sites and and with the stat center on how we even define race, ethnicity, what are the categories that we need to, to uh, record in our forms that they're relevant for SWOG. So a lot of uh, topics that we will continue discussing in our meetings. Um, it's exactly 12.15. Thank you all. Uh, really, uh, Rachel, Court, uh, John, you guys really are our compass, of course. Dacia, you keep everybody, you know, on track and knowledgeable and, and we couldn't do it without you. The ops team, the whole foundation under the leadership of Dr. Blanke, we continue to, to receive support for, for our Latin America initiative. Uh, and I think we got a clear message throughout our presentations that, that there's incredible talent, that there's a lot of excitement and that this is uh, important to, to increase diversity in the clinical trials, to bring newer treatments to other sites. It's important, it's the right thing to do. So thank you all for being part of that, for being here. Um, thank you, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, for the Latin Americans in the house, if you could stay for five minutes and we can have a brief con uh, conversation with Dr. Greenlee that would be great because she came especially to talk to you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, for everybody. Attending.